Anxiety might be alleviated by regulating gut bacteria People who experience anxiety symptoms might be helped by taking steps to regulate the microorganisms in their gut using probiotic and non-probiotic food and supplements, suggests a review of studies published today in the journal General Psychiatry. Anxiety symptoms are common in people with mental diseases and a variety of physical disorders, especially in disorders that are related to stress. Previous studies have shown that as many as a third of people will be affected by anxiety symptoms during their lifetime. Increasingly, research has indicated that gut microbiota, the trillions of microorganisms in the gut which perform important functions in the immune system and metabolism by providing essential inflammatory mediators, nutrients and vitamins, can help regulate brain function through something called the gut-brain axis. Recent research also suggests that mental disorders could be treated by regulating the intestinal microbiota, but there is no specific evidence to support this. Therefore a team of researchers from the Shanghai Mental Health Center at Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of Medicine, set out to investigate if there was evidence to support improvement of anxiety symptoms by regulating intestinal microbiota. They reviewed 21 studies that had looked at 1,503 people collectively. Of the 21 studies, 14 had chosen probiotics as interventions to regulate intestinal microbiota IRIFs, and 7 chose non-probiotic ways, such as adjusting daily diets. Probiotics are living organisms found naturally in some foods that are also known as good or friendly bacteria because they fight against harmful bacteria and prevent them from settling in the gut. The researchers found that probiotic supplements in seven studies within their analysis contained only one kind of probiotic, two studies used a product that contained two kinds of probiotics, and the supplements used in the other five studies included at least three kinds. Overall, 11 of the 21 studies showed a positive effect on anxiety symptoms by regulating intestinal microbiota, meaning that more than half 52% of the studies showed this approach to be effective, although some studies that had used this approach did not find it worked. Of the 14 studies that had used probiotics as the intervention, more than a third 36% found them to be effective in reducing anxiety symptoms, while six of the remaining seven studies that had used non-probiotics as interventions found those to be effective, a 86% rate of effectiveness. Some studies had used both the IRIF interventions to regulate intestinal microbiota approach and treatment as usual. In the five studies that used treatment as usual and IRIF as interventions, only studies that had conducted non-probiotic ways got positive results that showed a reduction in anxiety symptoms. Non-probiotic interventions were also more effective in the studies that used IRIF alone. In those studies only using IRIF, 80% were effective when using non-probiotic interventions, while only 45% were found to be effective when using probiotic ways. The authors say one reason that non-probiotic interventions were significantly more effective than probiotic interventions was possible due to the fact that changing diet a diverse energy source could have more of an impact on gut bacteria growth than introducing specific types of bacteria in a probiotic supplement. Also, because some studies had involved introducing different types of probiotics, these could have fought against each other to work effectively, and many of the intervention times used might have been too short to significantly increase the abundance of the imported bacteria. Most of the studies did not report serious adverse events, and only four studies reported mild adverse effects such as dry mouth and diarrhea. This is an observational study, and as such, cannot establish cause. Indeed, the authors acknowledge some limitations, such as differences in study design, subjects, interventions and measurements, making the data unsuitable for further analysis. Nevertheless, they say the overall quality of the 21 studies included was high. The researchers conclude, we find that more than half of the studies included showed it was positive to treat anxiety symptoms by regulation of intestinal microbiota. There are two kinds of interventions, probiotic and non-probiotic interventions, to regulate intestinal microbiota, and it should be highlighted that the non-probiotic interventions were more effective than the probiotic interventions. More studies are needed to clarify this conclusion since we still cannot run meta-analysis so far. They also suggest that, in addition to the use of psychiatric drugs for treatment, we can also consider regulating intestinal flora to alleviate anxiety symptoms. 
How to enhance or suppress memories What if scientists could manipulate your brain so that a traumatic memory lost its emotional power over your psyche? Steve Ramirez, a Boston University neuroscientist fascinated by memory, believes that a small structure in the brain could hold the keys to future therapeutic techniques for treating depression, anxiety, and PTSD, someday allowing clinicians to enhance positive memories or suppress negative ones. Inside our brains, a cashew-shaped structure called the hippocampus stores the sensory and emotional information that makes up memories, whether they be positive or negative ones. No two memories are exactly alike, and likewise, each memory we have is stored inside a unique combination of brain cells that contain all the environmental and emotional information associated with that memory. The hippocampus itself, although small, comprises many different subregions all working in tandem to recall the elements of a specific memory. Now, in a new paper in Current Biology, Ramirez and a team of collaborators have shown just how pliable memory is if you know which regions of the hippocampus to stimulate, which could someday enable personalized treatment for people haunted by particularly troubling memories. Many psychiatric disorders, especially PTSD, are based on the idea that after there's a really traumatic experience, the person isn't able to move on because they recall their fear over and over again, says Brianna Chen, first author of the paper, who is currently a graduate researcher studying depression at Columbia University. In their study, Chen and Ramirez, the paper's senior author, show how traumatic memories, such as those at the root of disorders like PTSD, can become so emotionally loaded. By artificially activating memory cells in the bottom part of the brain's hippocampus, negative memories can become even more debilitating. In contrast, stimulating memory cells in the top part of the hippocampus can strip bad memories of their emotional oomph, making them less traumatic to remember. Well, at least if you're a mouse. Using a technique called optogenetics, Chen and Ramirez mapped out which cells in the hippocampus were being activated when male mice made new memories of positive, neutral, and negative experiences. A positive experience, for example, could be exposure to a female mouse. In contrast, a negative experience could be receiving a startling but mild electrical zap to the feet. Then, identifying which cells were part of the memory-making process, which they did with the help of a glowing green protein designed to literally light up when cells are activated, they were able to artificially trigger those specific memories again later, using laser light to activate the memory cells. Their studies reveal just how different the roles of the top and bottom parts of the hippocampus are. Activating the top of the hippocampus seems to function like effective exposure therapy, deadening the trauma of reliving bad memories. But activating the bottom part of the hippocampus can impart lasting fear and anxiety-related behavioral changes, hinting that this part of the brain could be overactive when memories become so emotionally charged that they are debilitating. That distinction, Ramirez says, is critical. He says that it suggests suppressing overactivity in the bottom part of the hippocampus could potentially be used to treat PTSD and anxiety disorders. It could also be the key to enhancing cognitive skills, like Limitless, he says, referencing the 2011 film starring Bradley Cooper in which the main character takes special pills that drastically improve his memory and brain function. The field of memory manipulation is still young. It sounds like sci-fi but this study is a sneak preview of what's to come in terms of our abilities to artificially enhance or suppress memories, says Ramirez, a BU College of Arts and Sciences assistant professor of psychological and brain sciences. Although the study got its start while Chen and Ramirez were both doing research at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, its data has been the backbone of the first paper to come out of the new laboratory group that Ramirez established at BU in 2017. We're a long way from being able to do this in humans, but the proof of concept is here, Chen says. As Steve likes to say, never say never. Nothing is impossible. This is the first step in teasing apart what these brain regions do to these really emotional memories. The first step toward translating this to people, which is the holy grail, says memory researcher Sheena Jocelyn, a University of Toronto neuroscientist who was not involved in this study. Steve's group is really unique in trying to see how the brain stores memories with the goal being to help people. They're not just playing around but doing it for a purpose. 
Although mouse brains and human brains are very different, Ramirez, who is also a member of the BU Center for Systems Neuroscience and the Center for Memory and Brain, says that learning how these fundamental principles play out in mice is helping his team map out a blueprint of how memory works in people. Being able to activate specific memories on demand, as well as targeted areas of the brain involved in memory, allows the researchers to see exactly what side effects come along with different areas of the brain being overstimulated. Let's use what we're learning in mice to make predictions about how memory functions in humans, he says. If we can create a two-way street to compare how memory works in mice and in humans, we can then ask specific questions in mice about how and why memories can have positive or negative effects on psychological health. This work was supported by a National Institutes of Health Early Independence Award, a Young Investigator Grant from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, a Ludwig Family Foundation Grant, and the McKnight Foundation Memory and Cognitive Disorders Award study identifies dog breeds, physical traits that pose highest risk of biting children new research at the Ohio State University College of Medicine and the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center identifies dog breeds and physical traits that pose the highest risk of biting with severe injury. Doctors want parents of young children to use this information when deciding which dog to own. The study, published in the International Journal of Pediatric Otorhinolaryngology, explores the risks of dog bite injuries to the face in children and bite severity by breed, size and head structure. Researchers found pit bulls and mixed breed dogs have the highest risk of biting and cause the most damage per bite. The same goes for dogs with wide and short heads weighing between 66 and 100 pounds. The purpose of this study was to evaluate dog bites in children, and we specifically looked at how breed relates to bite frequency and bite severity, said Dr. Garth Essig, lead author and otolaryngologist at Ohio State's Wexner Medical Center. Because mixed breed dogs account for a significant portion of dog bites, and we often didn't know what type of dog was involved in these incidents, we looked at additional factors that may help predict bite tendency when breed is unknown like weight and head shape. To assess bite severity, researchers reviewed 15 years of dog-related facial trauma cases from Nationwide Children's Hospital and the University of Virginia Health System. They looked at wound size, tissue tearing, bone fractures and other injuries severe enough to warrant consultation by a facial trauma and reconstructive surgeon and created a damage severity scale. Researchers also performed an extensive literature search from 1970 to current for dog bite papers that reported breed to determine relative risk of biting from a certain breed. This was combined with hospital data to determine relative risk of biting and average tissue damage of bite. There's an estimated 83 million owned dogs in the United States and that number continues to climb, said Dr. Essig. We wanted to provide families with data to help them determine the risk to their children and inform them on which types of dogs do well in households with kids. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 4.7 million people in the United States are bitten by dogs annually, and 20% of these victims require medical care for their injuries. Those who require treatment after dog bites are predominantly children ages 5 to 9 years. Young children are especially vulnerable to dog bites because they may not notice subtle signs that a dog may bite, said Dr. Charles Elmerafi, study co-author, associate professor of otolaryngology at Ohio State's College of Medicine and chief of otolaryngology at Nationwide Children's Hospital. We see everything from simple lacerations to injuries in which there's significant tissue loss that needs grafting or other reconstructive surgery. Dr. K. Craig Kent, Dean of the Ohio State University College of Medicine said, this research highlights a significant public health issue and provides a new decision-making framework for families considering dog ownership. The circumstances that cause a dog to bite vary and may be influenced by breed behavior tendencies and the behavior of the victim, parents and dog owner. Children imitate their parents, said Megan Heron, associate professor of veterinary clinical services at Ohio State's College of Veterinary Medicine. Be a model for your child and avoid any confrontational or risky interactions that might trigger a fear or fear aggression response if the child were to mimic it. This includes harsh reprimands, smacking, pushing off of furniture and forcibly taking away an item. Heron offers the following tips for dog owners. Most bites to children occur from a family dog when the dog is resting and the child approaches. 
Try to provide and encourage resting places away from where children run and play. Many bites to children occur even when an adult is in the room. If you can't devote your attention to the interactions between the dog and child, it may be best to have a physical barrier between them, such as a baby gate or crate for the dog. This is especially important for toddlers whose behaviors may be more erratic, unpredictable or frightening to a dog. Teach children to let resting dogs lie and to stay out of dog crates, beds and other resting places that are designated for the dog. If the dog's favorite spot is on the couch, put a towel or blanket down to clearly delineate the dog space versus child space. Children should not approach, touch or otherwise interact with dogs while they are eating. Provide quiet areas for dogs to eat away from areas where children run and play. Rawhides and other flavored chews should only be given when dogs are separated from child play areas. Teach children to find an adult if a dog takes one of their toys or snacks. Children should never attempt to retrieve these items themselves. Other researchers involved in this study were Dr. Cameron Sheehan, Dr. Shafali Ricky, and Dr. J. Jared Christoffel. New causes of autism found in junk DNA leveraging artificial intelligence techniques, researchers have demonstrated that mutations in so-called junk DNA can cause autism. The study, published May 27 in Nature Genetics, is the first to functionally link such mutations to the neurodevelopmental condition. The research was led by Olga Troyanskaya in collaboration with Robert Darnell. Troyanskaya is Deputy Director for Genomics at the Flatiron Institute Center for Computational Biology CCB, in New York City and a professor of computer science at Princeton University. Darnell is the Robert and Harriet Heilbrunn Professor of Cancer Biology at Rockefeller University and an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Their team used machine learning to analyze the whole genomes of 1,790 individuals with autism and their unaffected parents and siblings. These individuals had no family history of autism, meaning the genetic cause of their condition was probably spontaneous mutations rather than inherited mutations. The analysis predicted the ramifications of genetic mutations in parts of the genome that do not encode proteins, regions often mischaracterized as junk DNA. The number of autism cases linked to the non-coding mutations was comparable to the number of cases linked to protein coding mutations that disable gene function. The implications of the work extend beyond autism, Troyanskaya says. This is the first clear demonstration of non-inherited, non-coding mutations causing any complex human disease or disorder. Scientists can apply the same techniques used in the new study to explore the role non-coding mutations play in diseases such as cancer and heart disease, says study co-author Jian Zhou of CCB and Princeton. This enables a new perspective on the cause of not just autism, but many human diseases. Only 1 to 2 percent of the human genome is made up of genes that encode the blueprints for making proteins. Those proteins carry out tasks throughout our bodies, such as regulating blood sugar levels, fighting infections and sending communications between cells. The other 98 percent of our genome isn't genetic dead weight, though. The non-coding regions help regulate when and where genes make proteins. Mutations in protein coding regions account for at most 30% of autism cases in individuals without a family history of autism. Evidence suggested that autism-causing mutations must happen elsewhere in the genome as well. Uncovering which non-coding mutations may cause autism is tricky. A single individual may have dozens of non-coding mutations, most of which will be unique to the individual. This make the traditional approach of identifying common mutations among affected populations non-viable. Troyanskaya and her colleagues took a new approach. They trained a machine learning model to predict how a given sequence would affect gene expression. This is a shift in thinking about genetic studies that we're introducing with this analysis, says Chandra Thiesfeld, a research scientist in Troyanskaya's lab at Princeton. In addition to scientists studying shared genetic mutations across large groups of individuals, here we're applying a set of smart, sophisticated tools that tell us what any specific mutation is going to do, even those that are rare or never observed before. The researchers studied the genetic basis of autism by applying the machine learning model to a treasure trove of genetic data called the Simons Simplex Collection. 
The Simons Foundation, the Flatiron Institute's parent organization, produced and maintains the repository. The Simons Simplex collection contains the whole genomes of nearly 2,000 quartets made up of a child with autism, an unaffected sibling and their unaffected parents. These foursomes had no previous family history of autism, meaning that non-inherited mutations were probably responsible for the affected child's condition. Such mutations occur spontaneously in sperm and egg cells as well as in embryos. The researchers used their model to predict the impact of non-inherited, non-coding mutations in each child with autism. They then compared those predictions with the effects of the same, unmutated strand in the child's unaffected sibling. The design of the Simon Simplex collection is what allowed us to do this study, says Joe. The unaffected siblings are a built-in control. Non-coding mutations in many of the children with autism-altered gene regulation, the analysis suggested. Moreover, the results suggested that the mutations affected gene expression in the brain and genes already linked to autism, such as those responsible for neuron migration and development. This is consistent with how autism most likely manifests in the brain, says study co-author Christopher Park, a research scientist at CCB. It's not just the number of mutations occurring, but what kind of mutations are occurring. The researchers tested the effects of some of the non-coding mutations in laboratory experiments. They inserted predicted high-impact mutations found in children with autism into cells and observed the resulting changes in gene expression. These changes affirmed the model's predictions. Troyanskaya says she and her colleagues will continue improving and expanding their method. Ultimately, she hopes the work will improve how genetic data are used for diagnosing and treating diseases and disorders. Right now, 98% of the genome is usually being thrown away, she says. Our work allows you to think about what we can do with the 98%.